I say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. It never ceases to amaze me how it is possible to hold webinars with participants in different parts of the world. You are all most welcome to this lecture on the freedom of expression, or rather the lack of freedom of expression in Hong Kong. My name is Turbjörn Ludien, Lotopi in Chinese, and I'm the head of the Stockholm China Center at ISDP. Today's lecture is part of the ISDP's Hong Kong program. Our speaker today is the scholar and democracy activist, Dr. Kim Wa Jung from Hong Kong, who is now living in exile in the UK. And our moderator is my colleague and friend, Professor Joseph Yushek Cheng, who will introduce Dr. Jung. Professor Joseph Yushek Cheng is one of the most prominent political scientists from Hong Kong, where he served for many years as chair professor and also for a few years as a dean at City University of Hong Kong. Joseph is not only a prominent scholar, but has for many years played a central, crucial ro ro role for the democracy movement in Hong Kong. Recently, he has published a fascinating autobiography of more than 600 pages entitled Struggling for Democracy in Hong Kong, My Story, which is available at Amazon. I highly recommend this book to all of you who are interested in Hong Kong, how Hong Kong has developed and in the present situation there. Since the crackdown on the democracy movement, Joseph is living in Auckland, New Zealand. It's a great honor for the ISDP that, he, that Joseph is a non-resident senior research fellow with the ISDP. He has helped us design our research program on Hong Kong, which I hope under his guidance will continue to develop. With these words, I uh, give the floor, I yield the floor to Professor Joseph Yu Cheng. Please, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you for your very, very kind words. Uh, we were just talking before the seminar that it is usually rather difficult to keep the uh, global community's attention on a small place like Hong Kong. And we are very, very grateful that the, uh, that the Stockholm China Center of ISDP has been helping us to uh, remind people to highlight uh, the situation in Hong Kong. Uh, Today, we are very honored to have Dr. Kim Wa Jung uh, talking about this topic of how Hong Kong's freedom of expression has been crashed. Uh, I think if you pay attention a little bit to the uh, Reporters Without Borders annual survey, annual ranking of various places, uh, freedom of, med of the media, you certainly will be surprised that Hong Kong's ranking has been dropping very sharply in the recent uh, five years or so. And uh, just, uh, just as an associated phenomenon, it is rather dangerous, it is rather difficult for people to, to stand for election to the Hong Kong Journalists Association. Uh, there is a lot of worry that if you belong, if you work for the association, you may be harassed, you may eventually be prosecuted and so on. Uh, and on this important topic, I shall not delay you anymore. I shall call upon Dr. Chong to start his talk right now. I just want to add that Dr. Chong has been a famous social scientist teaching at the Hong Kong Polytechnic U for many years. And uh, when people become uh, discouraged, when they tend to keep relatively quiet, adopt a low, low profile in the last five, six, seven years, uh, Dr. Chong had adopted a very courageous stand and has spoken out. And as a result, uh, he is one of the famous internet commentators while in Hong Kong and still while outside Hong Kong. Normally commentators lose a bit of uh, their audience once they are outside Hong Kong, but this has not been the case with Dr. Zhong 
and uh, I'm sure we all know, want to know his secrets, but naturally his frankness, his courage, his good analysis are some of the factors explaining this uh, outstanding phenomenon. Uh, Dr. Chong, please. Thank you so much, Feng. Thank you for your for your for your introduction. And I think I, I have to say that uh, uh, Professor Zhang has been my teacher when I was an undergraduate student. So uh, if you have any any meaningful things to share, part of this uh, can be attributed to Professor Zhang's inspiration when I was in my formative years. Thank you so much for introducing me and inviting me. I'm so glad to have this chance to talk to people from different parts of the world so that people's attention on Hong Kong can be aroused because I, I always have a fear that uh, with time, more and more people outside Hong Kong will lose their interest in Hong Kong just because Hong Kong is a very small place in the world. But you know, uh, Hong Kong is also a very important financial sector it used to be an important financial sector. I'm not sure whether it's going to be like that again in the future. And Hong Kong is also a very important window for us to understand uh, China, because uh, since 1997, we have been guaranteed the one country, two system uh, uh, as a very important experiment uh, for a previous colony to go back to its mother country. Um, I don't have a autobiography to share, just like Professor Jiang, but I will start for myself. Uh, as introduced by, by Professor Jiang, I have been in UK for 14 months. Uh, for the last three decades, I have been an academic. I teach in Hong Kong. I research in Hong Kong and I, like to play the role of a proper intellectual so that I can inform the society and to talk out what I what I what I expect a normal society had to pay attention to. So uh with uh with my background as I'm born in Hong Kong, raised in Hong Kong, being educated in Hong Kong, my whole life have been in Hong Kong and I, I have never think about migrating to other countries, even before January last year. <laughs> I come to UK April last year, but before January of last year, I have no idea that I will leave Hong Kong in my lifetime, particularly at this age. I, I just retired two years ago, and I, 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 I think about to spend, my rest of the, spend the rest of my life in Hong Kong, touring around China, and seeing some scenario I used to admire in my, in my childhood and adolescence. But now I have to uh, stay by, by Luton that I, I, I have been exiled in the in UK. <laughs> of course, I'm not consider myself an exile because I am not wanted by the Hong Kong government. But in reality, I understand quite well that uh, because of my ongoing commentary on Hong Kong society, on China, and on the public, OP, public policies in Hong Kong, I have become a target for the national security police in Hong Kong uh, as early as 2020. So I have, to, I have to pay attention. I have to become more careful. And I have been repeatedly warned by some of my friends to say that, Chong, it's time for you to reconsider. You have, you may have to sign up, up a little bit. You have to be less noisy because uh, under the recent situation, under the political circumstances of Hong Kong, uh, what you are doing in the last 30 years is no longer, no longer valid in Hong Kong in the sense that you will become invalid if you keep trying to do so. So I have been repeatedly warm by some of my friends. And even when I walk to the street, some people come, come to me saying that, Mr. Jung, I know you. Uh, I, I really want you to leave Hong Kong because uh, uh, you will not be safe in Hong Kong anymore. So that's why uh, last year, earlier last year, I made the decision uh, because I, as an academic, as a commentator, 
I always believe that my freedom of expression is the most important freedom at all. If people are not without uh, freedom of expression, all other freedom are, are not, 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 no longer valid. Say, for example, if we have no information, we are no we are not able to to sh to share our our wills and ideas openly then there is there is becoming more and more meaningless to talk about freedom of freedom of information freedom of force right so i i as an academic and as a commentator for many years i always believe that freedom of expression is the basic of all other form of expression but as my freedom of expression, which have been have been have been assumed for 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 the for my whole life, and I use that freedom of expression to inform the society, to inform the government, are now being regarded as endangering my own freedom. I have to make a choice. So that's why uh, last. February in 2020, I make a decision that maybe I have to leave Hong Kong for a while and to wait for a time when I'm able to go back to Hong Kong and to maintain my freedom of expression again. I don't know when, but I'm trying to trying to think about this and I'm trying to work for this. And that's why after I come to UK, I keep voicing out. I keep what I have been doing in Hong Kong just as I am in Hong Kong so that uh, I can keep on, keep on informing the society, keep on informing the government what people or what some people I know have in their mind. I'm not the only case to, to be like that because uh, you know, in the last three years, more than 300,000 people have left Hong Kong they have different reasons to leave Hong Kong, but I, I I can tell you that many people in in my social circle, a lot of academic, uh, if they want to preserve their their free will, they they have to leave Hong Kong because in Hong Kong, um, free will is becoming a dangerous thing. Free will is something that the government try to combat. And so people like me and some people who don't like their kids to lose their free will, they choose to leave Hong Kong. And this is the most important and most massive wave of immigrants in the last three or four decades. Hong Kong had experienced three waves, uh, previously two waves of immigration from 1980s, from 1984 to 1989. There is the first wave of immigrant from immigration from Hong Kong because uh, uh, Sino and Britons are, are, arrived at some agreement to hand over Hong Kong to China in 1997. Some Hong some Hong Kong people just choose not to believe, and they leave Hong Kong because they don't want to live in Hong Kong anymore after 1997. So from 1984 to 1989, uh, there there were about 120,000 people left Hong Kong because they, they want to migrate away, away from Hong Kong. But this changed a little bit because uh, after 1988, people seems to be stabilized and seems to have some restoration of faith on the future of Hong Kong. So the, that wave of immigration calmed down. But soon after 1989, you know, the Tiananmen massacre, uh, another wave of immigration started in 1990s. And that wave of immigration also lasts for five years. And in that wave of immigration from 1990 to 1995, about 300,000 people left Hong Kong. That is two and a half times more than the previous wave. And of course, the 1997 is approaching. And many people started to have an urgent need to leave Hong Kong, to leave Hong Kong, if they choose not to believe. But because of the deepening of economic reform in, in China after 1992, many people started to believe again. And the, the, and the, and the wave of migration calmed down in 1995 and afterward. 
And then come 1997. And from 1997, the handover of the 70 to Hong, to, of, of Hong Kong to China, there, there was no massive migration from Hong Kong for 20 years. But now from 2020, after the enactment of the so-called national security law in Hong Kong, and just about two, two, less than three years, we have, according to the recent statistic, we had more than 360,000 people left Hong Kong already in just two and a half years time. And that is a figure much bigger than the two, two previous wave of immigration. And I suppose this wave of immigration is going to last for more than eight years or even last to 10 years, because uh, unlike the last two wave of immigration, uh, people are not, are not just not believing. They felt a realistic threat to their normal living, just like me. So we have to leave. Otherwise, we will be caught, arrest, or at least harassed by the National Security Division of the Police. I myself, before I leave Hong Kong last April, I have been harassed by the National Security Police three times. Just because what I, what I do in the Public Opinion Research Institute, just because what I spit out publicly. Of course, they have not yet arrested me. Uh, by the end of last January. But I know I have been targeted. I have been repeatedly warned by my friends and subtly by the authority. So I have to make this decision to leave Hong Kong in order to preserve my free will, in order to, 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 to preserve my freedom of expression, which I used to have in the last 30 or even 40 years. I, I would say that Hong Kong, the recent situation of Hong Kong is so depressing. Hong Kong is no longer the society or a city once known to Hong Kong and many other people in the world. After the enactment of the national security law in 2020, uh, I think that the society had been overwhelmed by some kind of white terror. Everyone in the society had been had been threatened that their what they had expressed the openly, what they had posted to Facebook, even what they uh, for for some teachers, what they had what they have say or conveyed to to their students, will be evidence for the government to harass them or arrest them. After nineteen, after nineteen, uh, after two, 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 oh, I would say that Hong Kong has lost all of its independent class in Hong Kong. In the in, in the surface, we know that there are still one or two independent media in Hong Kong. But if you look into the content of this media. You know, there is a very serious problem of shelf censorship. And, and for the column writer, if they are named by the authority, if they are named by the mouthpiece of the authority, soon after they have been named, their column will be disappear from the, from the newspaper. And that is what I have to say about the freedom of expression in Hong Kong. Nobody is free to express. No, for, no, no problem is safe if you keep on maintaining your free will or expressing your, your will, will think, will, will thought. So this is a very, very depressing. And this is one of the core problems now facing Hong Kong people. And apart from that, many promises made by the Mastermind in Beijing since 1980s, when the Hong Kong future problem had been raised, all those promises have been denied. 
we have been promised that Hong Kong people is going to run Hong Kong. But as Professor Zhang mentioned earlier, we now had no free election in Hong Kong. All candidates running for election to the Legislative Council had to be screened by the authority, by Beijing. No, I, I would say that there is no independent legislator in our council in nowadays Hong Kong. I have to say no, not one of them. If they maintain their free will, if they, if they say something offensive to the authority in Hong Kong, if they say something offensive to Beijing, they will not be, not, they will not, not have this, this opportunity to be to be the legislator. And apart from election, uh, we don't have free press. And even ordinary people, when they when they say something in Facebook, they will run the risk of being arrested by the police. Uh, just recently, uh, a very young student who study in Japan. She so say something about Hong Kong in Facebook, just in Facebook. And when she returned to Hong Kong for some, for some, for some personal business, she was caught in the airport and now facing an accusation. And she is now not allowed to leave Hong Kong. She's under arrest and her study had been, had been broken. And her fate will be to, will be to be to be decided by the by the court, and the situation is quite pessimistic for for cases like this because, uh, as you know, uh, the national security law and other related legislation used to target against people who are outspoken had a hundred percent successful rate in the court for the government. This is the reality. And this is something uh, promised. We, we, we have been promised that after 1997, we will become an, a very special region in China, a special administrative region. Uh, we will guarantee our way of life will remain unchanged. We guarantee that uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and all kind of freedom we enjoy under the colonial period will be preserved. And our way of life will remain unchanged. But now we people living in Hong Kong can tell it clearly and loudly that our way of life has been in danger. We are even in an even worse situation when we compare with people living in Shanghai. You, you, are, you are living in Shanghai. You don't have to worry that you say something in the Weibo. It's going to, to be arrested by the police at the next morning. But in Hong Kong, you do. In, in, in Shanghai, in Beijing, we can still find some independent scholar saying something bravely to open something on government policy in, in China. But in Hong Kong, you can look, in, look back to, to the situation in Hong Kong in the last one or two years. I would say that no academic from the different institution in Hong Kong uh, is now able to come up and say something against the interests of the government. And this is the reality, right? And I think uh, we have to understand why Hong Kong people insist on maintaining our way of life uh, so much. First of all, we have been we have been living under that situation even before the colonial period. And we have been promised that this way of life will be, will be, will be preserved. Unlike another neighboring colony, Macau, my parents come from Macau. And I know about Macau quite, quite well because I, I travel back to Macau every year when I, when I was, was, a, was a children and, and as an adolescent. Even I went back to, to Macau several years back. In Macau, there is no open guarantee by the CCP in Beijing that their way of life will be preserved. There is no guarantee that, our, that the political system in Macau is going to moving forward to universal suffrage, 
or to have any separation saying that Macau people is going to decide how to reform their political system. But in Hong Kong, when British and China agree on the 1997 handover, it had been promised to Hong Kong people, promised to UK, and promised to the international community that way of life in Hong Kong will be protected. And afterward, the, and the, the, the drafting of the basic law, which has become a meaty constitution for Hong Kong after 1907, all this had been clearly laid down. It laid down clearly that uh, for the first colonial uh, of Hong Kong SAL government in 2007, Hong Kong people is allowed will, will be allowed to decide how the chief executive will be elected, and the pace of political reform and open up of the legislative council is also a decision of Hong Kong people. And this has been clearly laid down in the appendix of the basic law. And China had to make this promise to the international community simply because Hong Kong's society's nature is not similar to Macau. Macau is never an, an international city, but Hong Kong is an international financial center. And many people, even investors from the West, many people choose to stay and live in Hong Kong, have their stake in Hong Kong. So in order to maintain the confidence of people in Hong Kong and outside Hong Kong after 1997, the CCP in Beijing promised a lot to the Hong Kong people. And these promises have been made into a piece of international agreement uh, by Britain and China. And these promises have been laid down and stated clearly in the basic law, which had become the mini constitution in Hong Kong. That's why Hong Kong people had the, had the, had the background and had the mo most valid rationale for them to ask for an actualization of these promises. This is the first reason why Hong Kong is so insistent on the way of life. Secondly, Hong Kong is a very complex society. After several decades of rapid development, it is a society for 7 million people. And these people have the stake in the society and they want the society, and I myself as a Hong Kong girl, I want the society to be more reasonable, more rational, and to become a fair society. We are not pursuing equality in this uh, absolute sense, but we would like to see our society to become a more rational, rational, reasonable society, and to have some value for us to pursue as a, as a community. So um, because of this nature, uh, we look into the institutional makeup of Hong Kong society after 1997. We had to say that after more than 20 years of exper experiment of the one country, two system, and because of the, of the fail of the CCP to actualize its promises to let Hong Kong people to decide on our former government in 2007, Hong Kong society has become an even even more unjust society in the recent decade. Many young people feel that their, their room for development have been, have been stepped up. Many young people or younger generation believe that Hong Kong society is not a place for their next generation just because Hong Kong society is so unfair. And the policy making of the Hong Kong society is so skilled to the, to the privileged group and to some tycoon from, from mainland China, even. So many people come out to protest against... Sorry. Sorry, I have some technical problem. <laughs> uh, 
So when you come out to protest against the government, to ask for the government to be more reasonable, to be more open, to be more accountable. And all these appeals, I believe, is really satisfied because this has been promised. And this is also necessary for Hong Kong to live up to the expectation of a free society. We also hope that Hong Kong is going to develop, develop, develop further into a better place for more people in the future. And this, uh, this insistence may be not at all fit into the interest of the CTP because uh, uh, for, for the Communist Party in China, uh, they want to they want themselves to, to be in milk from some universal values, such as democracy, human right, freedom of expression, that kind of things. So when Hong Kong as an SAR under the under, under China, uh, they always want to want to make Hong Kong a special place which is not going to have any influence on, on mainland China. And with China becoming more and more autocratic in the in the last decade, Hong Kong as a place keep asking for autonomy, keep asking for the actualization of what had been promised, is becoming more and more intolerable for for officials in in Beijing, for the leaders in Beijing, and this tension had led to a series of protests in Hong Kong since 2010. We all remember the umbrella movement in 2014, right? In 2014, which is the time for another, another cycle of discussion on political reform in Hong Kong. Beijing had to make a decision on that. And so they decided to put up a very, very regressive proposal, making it unacceptable to most people in Hong Kong. And that, that cycle of discussion stirred up the umbrella movement, which I think many people in, in the world still remember. And after 2015, when this umbrella movement had been calmed down or crashed down, the seat for upheaval, the seats for discontent is still there in Hong Kong. So in 2019, when the government put up a legislation to repatriate Hong Kong people to mainland China, more people come out. And in 2019, more than 2 million people come out to protest against this piece of law and ask for a more accountable government and to, and to restate our, our desire for more open government in 2019. And that led to a series of protests and confrontation of people and the government. And so that's why the reason um, the China enacted the national security law in 2020 and totally destroying the original Hong Kong, making Hong Kong not a society we used to know at this moment. Some people may, may ask, with this background, is it fair to say that from the very beginning, when China promised Hong Kong people, promised UK, promised the international community that Hong Kong is going to have the one country, two system, Hong Kong people rule Hong Kong, from this very beginning of these promises, was this CCP intentionally, intentionally telling lies? I think about this problem on and off in the last few years. And I have no answer to this question because I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure whether it was a lie from the very beginning or not. But I have to say that this, was, this has become a lie on, if you look, look just into the reality of Hong Kong today. But if you look back, we know that some senior officials from, from the CCP seems to be quite genuine when they make these promises. Zhao Ziyang, the, 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 the premier, 
in the in nineteen in the in the eighties and ninety early ninety uh, up to up to nineteen eighty nine. He wrote a letter to the student unions of the two major university in Hong Kong, saying that Hong Kong people is a course to run Hong Kong after nineteen ninety seven. You don't have to worry. That letter can still be found in the internet. In early 1990s, when China, when China go into a, another wave of economic reform, the premier, Zhu Yongji, he once said openly that if the one country, two system experiment is fail, it is on, not only the failure of Hong Kong people, but it is also a failure of the CCP. So from this uh, piece of evidence, I would say that, I would say that, or I, I, I suspect that the original promise, when, or the original promises when they were made, may be genuine from, from, from the people who make these promises. But why are these promises become, become, become jokes nowadays? I would say that it has something to do with the system in mainland China. They are not intentionally lying, but the system itself is make is make is is constituting different forces to make these promises not able to become reality. First of all, I think that there are a group of local people in Hong Kong who would like to enjoy political free free lunch. To secure their to secure their position in the Hong Kong structure, even after 1997, they don't want to face up with the general public. They don't want to win election. They don't want to sponsor a political party, and they want to have a place in the in the in the government. So they so they keep doing something to to halt the political development in Hong Kong. And try to say something to make CCP reconsider those promises they make to Hong Kong people and the international community. And this is the first reason why. And nowadays we see these people had become legislator, had become officials, had become major advisor to the government, and have their places even in mainland China. So they are. Some rent seekers in Hong Kong political development. They sit. They 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 sit to sit to protect their own own interests in expenses of the of the of the interest and and well being of, of of the Hong Kong society. This is the first reason why these promises have been have been cancelled out. The second reason is something to do with the nature of the CCP. I I recall that in soon after the night the, the, the handover in 1997, the first director for the China Asian Office in Hong Kong, Jiang Anshu, I think some people still know him. Jiang Anshu, he had been the president of the Xinhua News Agency in Hong Kong before 1997. And then he became the first director for the China Asian office in Hong Kong after 1997. He wrote a book on Hong Kong handover. The book, the book had I I I I could not find an English translation translation of that book. And the title of that book is the context of big powers. Uh, it's tell the story of how China and UK negotiate on, on Hong Kong, some behind scenes debate and that kind of things. And in a chapter, he talked about how the Xinhua News Agency, and then later, that means the later China the Asian office in Hong Kong, how this um, mainland, mainland office in Hong Kong or, or mainland organization in Hong Kong uh, talk about their role 
after 1970. And he stayed clear like that. They, they, they had agreed on some important principle that they are just doing some liaison, liaison role. They, they, they should not interfere in Hong Kong's local affairs after 1997. And that is from Zhang Anshu, who is a very important figure to shape the way of Hong Kong when we are going back to China. So from these different pieces of information, I still believe that from the beginning, some people from the CCP is really, uh, they, they, are, they, they, they were really have a genuine, genuine belief that the one country, two system could work when this joint declaration is respected, when the basic law as a mini constitution is respected. They really believe that. But as I say, some people in Hong Kong, some, some political figures in Hong Kong keep doing something to, to hold back the development of Hong Kong's political system. They keep something, they, they do keep doing something to, to drag on our leg for development. So this is the one reason why the CCP had some second thought on that. And the second reason is that even with Jiang Anshu's speculation about how they feel, how they think about Hong Kong's Hong Kong situation and how the role of mainland official organization in Hong Kong should do in 1997. Under a totalitarian approach in China, those officials get used to get used to do whatever they like. They don't have to, they don't have to, they don't have to observe public opinion. They don't care about how the media media say, say about them. They, they expect medias and even academics and political parties or political organization just say in the same, just, just spit up in the same tone at the government soon afterward. But Hong Kong is not that society. We have a very, very diverse interest in the society itself. We have been a very uh, active, we have a very active civil society with a lot of organization and different interest groups. So people are, in Hong Kong just do not follow what those officials expect. And when Jiang Shu retire, some new officer from mainland come to Hong Kong. When they, when they want to expand their influence in Hong Kong society, they started to interfere. They started to, to, to do everything to make people forget what had been promised. They choose to promise themselves. They, they choose to for, forget those to forget those promises themselves. They try to do anything to intervene Hong, on Hong Kong's local affair. They try to influence how legislators vote in certain in certain bills or, or or discussion in the legislative council. They want to manipulate the elections in Hong Kong. And when this official do that, they are expanding their resources. They getting more funds from central government in Beijing. They become more, more notified in Hong Kong, more people know them. Uh, they become important figures, but just not just official or representative sent from Beijing to Hong Kong to do some nation duties. They, 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 they are not, not satisfied with that. They want to be the mastermind behind the Hong Kong government. And this is another factor leading to those, if I suppose to be genuine, genuine belief in one country system started to erode away. And as this official tried to do that, and when those Hong Kong politi political faker, which could not appeal to the public, they want to, to have their position and to secure the position. They want, they, they started to deny or undermine the, the local, local voices and opinion from local people and opinion from people like me. They want people like me to, to, to silence down. They want political party to be more obedient. They want ordinary people in Hong Kong to be, to be 
more submissive under the authority of the government and the and, and the CCP in Beijing. And this is the and since 2007 or soon after 2010, this had been some political forces started to have more intense in the play in the Hong Kong society that leading to the embellishment and uh, and the recent con uh, recent protests in 2009. And quite disappointingly, because of the because of the change in maybe change in the style of governing in CDP also, Xi Jinping as a more conservative leaders in the last two or three decades. And he want to restore a very strong leadership in the CCP and trying to make himself the one and only one prominent political figure in China history. So Hong Kong as a unique existence in China is becoming less and less tolerable for, for the CCP. And I think that is why uh, in 2020, they enact that piece of law which had taken all promises away from Hong Kong, making it not possible for us to express freely in Hong Kong, making all media has to silent, silent down or to close up, making all political party to dissolve, and a lot of concern group, interest group, labor union, and other classwork organization has to dissolve after 2020, or some major people who run this organization, who run the, run the parties, or who speed up to Hong Kong interests, or who have been elected representative to the legislative council, or who run the primary to sit for more, more position in the LESCO, have been arrested by the government, uh, in the name that they are inciting hatred against the government, they are they are inciting uh, a subversion to the state power, that kind of things, and so many people had lost their confidence in Hong Kong. Not just lost their confidence; they feel that our way of life has been jeopardized, and that we are no longer able to secure ourselves in a society like Hong Kong. So we have to leave. And that's why nowadays, even in, in a few days later, July 1st will be the date of another anniversary for Hong Kong reunification we, 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 we with China. And people, some people I know have been warned PRC by the by the national security police or by some people from the government saying that uh, you, you better stay at home that day. I want to know what you are going to do that day. Three or four years ago, low people in Hong Kong will, will, will suppose that this style of governance will be, will be there in Hong Kong. But now, it had become a very common practice in July 1st, in October the 1st, the National Day, in June 4th, and in some other important days for Hong Kong. And apart from that, not only, not only you can see that local press and local media had no, had no comment on this situation. Even when people are trying to do some opinion survey, uh, we have been used to conduct for more than more than thirty years, have been wanted to sign up, and I think this is very detrimental to the further development of Hong Kong, and that's why making more than three hundred and sixty thousand people left Hong Kong already in the last two and a half years. I myself, let's be back to myself. As I mentioned earlier, I have no idea that I would leave Hong Kong in my life. 
But secondly, I have to do that in order to preserve my freedom of expression. I know quite a lot of friends who are still staying in Hong Kong. They had no room for them to express themselves. Even your secondary school teacher, you have to be extremely careful. Just yesterday, I I was informed that a friend who who is a secondary school teacher decided to move to Taiwan in a, in next few months. He teach in a secondary school for more than twenty years, and recently he had received. Uh, I think the, the the government had received a complaint from the hotline that my friend. Has said something inappropriate in the in 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 the in the lecture. He could not he could not figure out how inappropriate that saying is when he talk about the communist upheaval in nineteen fifty or nineteen forty in in China. Up to up to this point. He decided to to leave Hong Kong. He will fly to Taiwan in a few months. He still could not figure out how appropriate that statement is. But uh, but but he is he is complained by one of his students. Uh, this has been reported to the government through a hotline, and his principal in school had received the information from the government. And are required to submit a report on his case, and he had received a warning from the government, the, from from the school administration, and he think that even as a teacher, he lost his freedom to express even in the classroom. Not to mention the media, not to mention mention openly talk about. Social situation, social issues, social policy, and public administration in Hong Kong. So this is the reason why so many people leave. And I and I I have no sophisticated study on this recently, but I have an idea that if the first two wave of immigration uh, is like is like that I have just mentioned, I believe that this wave of immigration. Or moving out from Hong Kong will last for more than ten years, and the number of people leaving Hong Kong will be more than, and will be more than two times, than the previous wave of immigration. As I mentioned, in and in nineteen ninety one to nineteen ninety five, we have three hundred thousand people leave Hong Kong, left Hong Kong, and I suppose that this is going to be even worse, um, for this wave of immigration, and more people. In order to preserve their their freedom, their free will, we choose to leave Hong Kong. Then, lastly, I would say, what what do I have to speculate on the future of Hong Kong? I always regard myself, and many people regard me as a optimistic guy. Optimistic guy. I. I myself embrace the reunification to China in early 1980, when I was in the when I was a college student in the Chinese University in Hong Kong. Even when situation become worse in 1989, I still believe that uh, something something is going to 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 change. Situations which was abnormal. Cannot be maintained for long. And after the handover, there have been a lot of upheaval and confrontation between the government and the public, and confrontation between Hong Kong people and Beijing. I still believe that we, if we stick to our our position, if we insist, if we just stick to the law, the basic law, and all those promises made by the CCP. One country, two system, is still something we have to pursue in order that Hong Kong can remain its unity 
and its uh, significance in the in, in the future. But unfortunately, I myself have to come to UK just because I don't believe anymore. I, at this moment, I have no answer to, to that question. How long will this situation last? And some people keep saying that the society of Hong Kong we know, we once know or used to know, is no longer possible. I could just say that I hope this is a forced speculation. I still believe that something abnormal cannot be maintained for long, but I don't know how long it would be. And what I, what I could say now is to ask for your ongoing attention to Hong Kong, to keep an eye on Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is a window for us to understand how China is changing. And I think as a country with 1.4 billion people, second major economic status in, in, in the world, the, the situation of China, how China will change, and how Hong Kong will change to shed a light on how China will change is still a very important window for us to look into this vast country. And just good luck to all of you and good luck to Hong Kong people. And, and I was sincerely look, looking forward that you are going to look into the Hong Kong situation in the future. Thank you so much. You are muted, uh, Joseph. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chong, for your highly enlightened talk. We now have a question from the floor, and we continue to welcome more and more questions, comments from the floor, as usual. Uh, Ms. Mr. Forster Kunnet would like to raise the issue of how can the democratic world help to preserve, to strengthen the remnants of the freedom of expression in the territory? How can, how can the world help? I, I, I personally feel that um, some part of the world are really helping Hong Kong people a lot. Say, for example, um, we can come to UK by the BNO 551 option. And Australia, Canada had opened up some life lifeboat measure for Hong Kong young people. And just two days ago, I, I received a, a friend told, telling me that uh, his seeking for asylum in Canada had been approved. He had been a polit political figure in Hong Kong, and he had to fly to Canada because he cannot leave Hong Kong, live in Hong Kong longer. And I think some 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 government is willing to doing, doing something to help Hong Kong people, but I think most important of all is that uh, don't forget Hong Kong. As I mentioned by the end of my of my sharing, uh, at least to understand the situation, not to let the propaganda of the CCP mislead you, and to and to give some spiritual support for people coming out from Hong Kong is very important. I, 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 so I expect that in, in a few years, maybe six, 600,000 or even 700,000 people will leave Hong Kong and go to different parts of the world. And luckily, unlike the last two waves of immigration, many people who move out from Hong Kong in this less than two and a half year, have some ability to, to, to add on the political platforms in different places. So uh, I think they, are, they, are, they, they will keep coming out. They, are, they will keep voicing out because uh, they still believe that we have to, to, to let the whole world know what had been exactly happening in Hong Kong. And, and that's why, as I, as I mentioned, even when I come to UK, 
I have been here for 14 months. I I stay in a community with neighbor from, from native UK, and they are very understanding. When I talk about Hong Kong with them, they all feel quite understanding. They are very acceptance. They are trying to do a thing to, to engage young young students in, in Hong, from Hong Kong in UK schools. And but 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 I also aware that uh with time the media uh from the West is losing some interest in some stories in Hong Kong because uh, those stories are similar. So I just want to plead for your ongoing attention to Hong Kong situation, to support organization or, or programs uh, host by Hong Kong interest group or Hong Kong, Hong Kong people, pe organization from Hong Kong people in, in, in your country and at least try to try to reconsider uh, those propaganda and official sayings from the CCP and to contrast those things with what you had heard from Hong Kong people which keep coming to your country. And that is the most important. Of course, if you had room, if you have organization, if you had any platform, try to voice out for, for not just Hong Kong people, for people from Tibet, people from Xinjiang, and to voice out for the reason military threat to Taiwan is also important. Thank you very much. Uh, while we wait for further questions, um, may I take the opportunity to ask one or two questions and seek enlightenment from you, Dr. Chong. Um, you see, roughly before 2019, the business community, the financial community in Hong Kong seem to uh, have a lot of influence on Beijing. They certainly did not fight for democracy in Hong Kong. They were not interested in democracy in Hong Kong, but they were aware. They were aware that rule of law, freedom of expression, and various types of freedoms are very important to the prosperity of Hong Kong, to the functioning of Hong Kong as an international financial center. As late as uh, the autumn of 2019, many of these people still, for example, asked for, a, for an independent of commission of inquiry into the riots, the disturbances in the previous few months in that year. Although uh, we all know, uh, they they were not effective. Their appeals mm -hmm. were ignored. My question is, why did this financial community, this business community, lose the influence on Beijing, lose the years of the Chinese leaders? And of course, at the moment, Chinese leaders are aware of the existing of the current economic difficulties in the country, and at least they would like to, uh, to uh, improve economic ties with the United States, at least not allow those economic ties to be decoupled and so on. They still want the dialogue with the American government, at least with the American business community. Will that help? First of all, I, I would say that uh, Hong Kong society is, is quite pragmatic in nature. And in particular, those uh, business cycle, business circle, uh, businessmen in Hong Kong, local business men in Hong Kong, uh, they had been they had gained a privileged privileged position under the colonial governance uh, before 1997, and when the Hong Kong colonial government started to open up in since mid 1980s, they 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 try a lot to, to preserve their perfect position. And they, they, and they, and they want to deter the, the, the development of political accountability of the Hong Kong government because uh, uh, they want to secure the influence to the government and policy, which is always more favorable to the business circle. And after 1997, this businessman had been a very major target for the CCP. Uh, the CCP in Beijing and the Hong Kong government uh, keep 
try try very hard to keep the privileged position in order that this businessman is obedient o obedient to to the CCP and try not to join forces for political for, for political re re reform aspiration. And so, uh, as a free rider in a society, they always too conservative in in the process. When the local classwood people in Hong Kong becoming more and more aware of the undesirability of this existing system, and as you as, as Professor Chang is quite quite correct saying that uh, in the early 19, 20, 2019, uh, when the bill was put up to the legislature, uh, a lot of business people they voice out their concern and and their uh, and their objection to that piece of legislation, to that bills. But when the government decided to go ahead with the bill in June 2019, the leader of the one of the most important political party of the business circle, the Liberal Party, he come up and say, there are lots of concern and reservation from the business cycle as I know it. But because we are a part of the establishment, when the government put up the bill for, for the legislature, we will still support the government. And I think this tells a lot, right? This tells us how compromising the business man in Hong Kong used to be and are going to be in the future. And then after 2020, when, when the national security law had been enacted, and a lot of oppression had been had been underway. Most of these businessmen choose to shut up, and nowadays, some of them, as I know, some of them just try to protect their business interests in Hong Kong. Some of them doing something to to divert their resources and business outside Hong Kong. And they choose not to say anything against the will of the CCP because at this moment, the Hong Kong government and the CCP in Beijing seems to be quite determined to totally abolish the civil society in Hong Kong. And when this civil society is being abolished, there is no room for even business people to say anything which is not welcome by the authority. And this is the reality they are facing. They, I think some of them is not feeling good at this moment. They are also aware of the potential harm of this is going to have on Hong Kong's international status. They, they know that the property, property price is dropping. They know that there are more than 15% um, vacancy rate in class A business premises in Hong Kong. They look that quite a lot of intelligence are now moving out from Hong Kong. Many, many, many good people, many well-educated people, professional people are moving from Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Chamber of Commerce had conducted two rounds of survey in 2001 and 2021 and 2023, 2023 saying that a lot of their members are facing a, a brain drain problem that they are not able to, to, to fix by their own. They are asking the government to do something to restore confidence in Hong Kong. But all the all, all the appeals have been have been have been heard, and nothing have been have been done to to preserve the confidence and to restore the confidence of people in Hong Kong. And this is the, the determination of the Bastamai in Beijing. So uh, I, I I cannot see any any room for this business cycle to to say anything further. Uh, uh, what they can do is to is to is to do something to to reduce their own risk 
uh, and now I believe is what they are doing. And that's why Hong Kong's economic situation is also quite gloomy in, in recent, recent months. And we all know that uh, after several decades of economic reform, the economic bubbles in China is quite, quite big. And I, I, I still went to China, different places in China in 2019. And I can tell you that I, I had, I had, I had said this more than once. When I went to Kunming, the inner, one of the inner city in China, when I went to Wuhan before who when I, I can see quite a lot of, quite a lot of so-called business, business complex empty. Still, still massive shopping mall is quite glorious in this appearance. But you can see uh, there is not much, not much people spending in this uh, glorious, um, uh, great the, the grand commercial complex. So we know that the situation of China is not that optimistic. Uh, optimistic also, but I just wonder the existing leader of CCP, Xi Jinping. All he all he wanted in his mind is to maintain his supremacy in the in the coming four and a half year. He seems to determine to sit for another term even after these terms. So with this in mind, I think he is not he is not quite concerned about what have been happening in the in the classroom. The official figures say that the unemployment rate for young people in in China city in, in cities in China is twenty point five percent. Doctor Zhong, I'm terribly sorry to have to interrupt you. Okay, this okay. So this is going to be. I, I don't think China, the CCP, is going to do anything to to change the course at this moment. You see, yes. due, due to another upcoming event at the ISTP, I have just been informed that we have to wrap up more or okay. less. So, okay. So may, may I just may, yes. I, may I turn to Professor Loden then? And do you? And certainly, we would very much like to have your last word to thank various people and so on. Yes, thank you very much, Joseph. I would like to say, first of all, I will be very brief now. I would like to say, first of all, that I find your lecture, Dr. Jung, extremely unusually insightful and illuminating. And in particular, I'm grateful to you for having shared part of your perspective of how Hong Kong's relationship with mainland China has evolved since the 1980s. How there was some optimism in Hong Kong in the 1980s, uh, leading up to the massacre in 89, which it was a terrible disappointment. But then mm -hmm. again, in the 90s, after perhaps Deng Xiaoping's travel to the South in the early 90s, some optimism uh, grew again. And so that at the time of the handover in 1997, quite a few uh, democracy activist fighters were quite optimistic that one country, two system would work. But then when, when people in Hong Kong started to speak about the need for direct elections of the chief executive, it became clear that the leadership in Be leaders in Beijing would not agree to this. At that time, Mr. Xi Jinping had also become, <laughs> was also becoming the paramount leader. So we don't really know how much this had to do with him personally. Uh, you mentioned that you believe that some of the leaders, and you mentioned Zhao Ziyang and Zhu Rongji, were really sincere about their idea of one country, two systems. I also like to think so. And I find it a bit um, sad that it has become quite fashionable today um, among many people to say that the, the people in Beijing have been lying all along. I also belong to those who believe that there are people in Beijing, even rather high up in the Communist Party, who are quite dissatisfied with the present situation. So in spite of the fact that the situation today looks extremely dismal and it's very difficult, not even I can, I think Dr. Tung and I share this um, innate 
optimism perhaps, but it's very difficult today to be an optimist. Nevertheless, I do believe, I mean, I was very encouraged to hear you say that you still believe that the formula one country, two system, mm -hmm. two systems, where could be workable. And that as I believe that we should assume that there are mm. people also uh, among leading uh, scholars and, and, and uh, officials in China who find the present policies vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong deeply mistaken and mm. bad, not only for Hong Kong, but also for China itself. May I end by saying that I remember well uh, one occasion in 2011 when I talked to one of China's most Nowadays, it is most prominent writers who told me that he was convinced that Hong Kong would play an important role in speeding up mm -hmm. before opening up in, in uh, mainland China. And that his vision was that just as Deng Xiaoping had set up special economic zones in, in China, mm -hmm. perhaps Shenzhen could become a special uh, political zone where, where experiments with democracy could be carried out. Of course, he's also very dis disillusioned today. Mm -hmm. But on this note, may I again express my heartfelt thanks to you for a lecture with a con which is very rare for mm -hmm. us in this part of the world to listen to. And also, uh, thank you very much, Joseph, for your contribution to this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Last thank but you. not least, I would like to thank my colleagues. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly. Uh, August Börjesson and Anna Jarnit for your excellent preparations for this seminar. Thank you so much. And please return to us when we get back to Hong Kong at ISTP. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Don't let us hope.